The magical rituals demonstrated in this video are performed by practicing magicians, not professional actors. These rites were recorded inside an actual magical temple, not on a Hollywood soundstage. The techniques shown are authentic and very effective. Viewers are warned against casual experimentation with these methods. Mind-altering substances should never be used in connection with this practice. Only mature persons in good mental and physical health should undertake these activities. This system should be approached with the same respect one would accord to a full contact martial art. This documentary is offered to the public as an educational introduction to an ancient Western tradition of psycho-spiritual development that has been misunderstood and maligned. Practitioners of Solomon's magic are not Satanists who make pacts with the devil. They are spiritual explorers in the deep caverns of the mind, carrying with them the lamp of wisdom and armed with the power of God. These be the seventy-two mighty kings and princes which King Solomon commanded into a vessel of brass, together with their legions. And it is to be noted that Solomon did this because of their pride. And when he had thus bound them up and sealed the vessel, he, by divine power, did hurl them into the depths of a lake in Babylon. I'm Polk Runyon. I'm a cultural anthropologist and a ceremonial magician. For the past 25 years, I've been studying and practicing our own culture's unique and powerful form of shamanism, while other anthropologists have completely ignored it. I've been fortunate enough to rediscover and reconstruct the actual techniques of ancient Western ceremonial magic. In this video documentary, we're going to take you along on an expedition to a strange world, in many ways more mysterious than the upper reaches of the Amazon, but a lot closer to home. For the very first time, we're going to show you the actual methods by which wizards and warlocks of olden times invoked holy angels and evoked lesser spirits to visible appearance and even had conversations with them. What you're going to see is real. These techniques are just as effective today as they were a thousand years ago. These methods have nothing to do with mind-altering drugs, and you don't even need any special psychic talent. These are the secrets of a lost art that anyone with imagination and determination can master. My personal magical adventure started back in 1969. At that time, I was a reclusive bachelor eking out a living writing pulp fiction for paperbacks and men's magazines. After years of pounding a typewriter while chain-smoking and constantly drinking coffee, my chronic indigestion finally turned into gut-wrenching stomach pains. The condition was misdiagnosed as an ulcer. Now, at that time, ulcers were thought to be psychosomatic, so being a macho former Green Beret, I wasn't about to become Casper and have to eat milk toast. No sissy neurotic disease like an ulcer was going to change my lifestyle. So I set out to heal myself through mastering self-hypnosis. In desperation, I learned the art quickly and was able to suppress the pain. But then it would come back, and it would be even worse. 
And I, I took myself about as deep into trance as anyone has ever gone, but I could not heal that ulcer because, as the doctors finally discovered when I was almost dead, I was carrying within me a gallbladder that had turned to solid rock. In the latter stages of my illness, I was in a state that I now realize was a toxic psychosis. In my desperate attempt to cure myself, I had gone beyond self-hypnosis into the study of Tibetan tantric yoga, and finally to what was at that time the least known and most forbidden of all the spiritual paths, Western ritual magic. I had been studying books about Western ceremonial magic, and even the old grimoires themselves, the medieval Key of Solomon, and the more notorious Goetia of the Lamegaton, the so-called Lesser Key, which catalogued and described the 72 genie of the Arabian Nights that old King Solomon had imprisoned in a fabulous brass vessel. In my irrational state, I was totally convinced that there was a hidden truth behind this fantastic story. Like Aladdin's wonderful lamp or Ali Baba's open sesame, there was a secret key to calling up those mighty princes of the jinn that Solomon had imprisoned so long ago, and I was determined to find it. I studied the writings of the ancient and modern magicians. They had filled their books with the most detailed instructions on how to build, inscribe, and decorate all the necessary equipment, all the signatures of the spirits, and even the hours during which to summon them. Conjurations and names of power were all set forth, complete and ready to recite. Hear me and make all spirits subject unto me so that every spirit of the firmament and of the aether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land and in the waters, of whirling air and of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Wonderful, powerful. All you have to do is recite it aloud, and you can feel the hairs start to rise on the back of your neck. But where, how, and in what form are these spirits we're summoning supposed to appear? That one all-important element, how to make the spirit physically appear, was always missing from the old grimoires. Now, I knew that over a dozen ancient and modern writers on magic couldn't be involved in one big, long-standing conspiracy to suppress this final secret, so it seemed obvious that at some time in the past, the key to the magical art had been lost. And the modern writers and experimenters just simply didn't know how it was done. This suspicion turned out to be true. At the turn of the last century, the famous, or if you prefer infamous, magician, Aleister Crowley, had tried to conjure one of the Lamegaton's Goetia demons out of incense smoke. And, not surprisingly, he had very little success after a great deal of effort. This did not surprise me. Trying to form an image or commanding a spirit to produce an image out of curling, twisting smoke was more of an experiment in telekinesis than a vision from beyond. Aleister Crowley did not possess the secret technique, but he certainly understood the philosophy. He stated clearly in his 1904 edition of the Goetia of the Lamegaton that the spirits of Solomon's brass vessel are portions of the human brain. Even though I might have been temporarily insane at the time, I had lost none of my intellect. I knew that magical visions were certainly hypnotic. In this respect, Crowley had been absolutely right. Solomon's genie would not come forth from caverns beneath the earth. They would rise out of the nether reaches of the deep mind. I noticed that the sigils of that the sigils of the Lamegaton's Goetia spirits were very similar to the Veves of Caribbean voodoo. I had done extensive research on voodoo for one of my adventure novels published in 1967. I knew the voodoo trance, wherein the participant becomes possessed by the spirit, was known to be hypnotic. The focal point of these ceremonies was the Veve of the Ogun drawn on the ground and illuminated by candles. 
somehow this symbolic signature helped to bring forth the vision. At this point, your high school science teacher might be saying, well, if all this magic is only in the mind, weren't those old wizards and even the modern magicians like that Crowley fellow just using their imagination? <laughs> yes, they certainly were. But the human imagination, inspired by its divine creator, is the most powerful force in the universe, a river of hopes and dreams that bears us all along on its flowing course from the beginning to the end of time, from planet Earth out to the farthest star. Let us recall a few lines from the greatest of the romantic poets, William Wordsworth. Of shouting angels and the imperial thrones, I pass them unalarmed. Not chaos, not the darkest pit of lowest Erebus, or aught of blinder vacancy scooped out by help of dreams can breed such fear and awe as fall upon us when we look into our minds, into the mind of man. With that in mind, Let's look at the philosophy and the psychology that lies behind this powerful system. To begin with, we should not make the mistake of thinking that those old magicians were credulous and naive enough to believe that they could physically manifest the kind of heavenly glories and hellish horrors that Bosch and Blake depicted. These artists, like the Hollywood movie makers of today, symbolize the subtle power of magic with intense and sometimes lurid physical images. In magical operations, the roof does not fly off as choirs of angels descend in blinding rays of light, nor does the floor crack open to disgorge a horde of fire-breathing demons. The actual effects of magic are very powerful, but they are also subtle and subjective. As Cornelius Agrippa, one of the greatest of the Renaissance magicians, explained, There is another meaning than what is writ in the bare letters about this magical art. We must not look for the principle of these grand operations outside of ourselves. It is that internal spirit within us which can very well perform whatsoever the monstrous mathematicians, the prodigious magicians, the wonderful alchemists, and the bewitching necromancers can affect. Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa was certainly an honored philosopher and magus, but we should remember that King Solomon was considered to have been the wisest man who ever lived. The wisdom of Solomon was proverbial. Therefore, we should not be surprised to discover that Solomon's art of magic was actually an ancient system of psychology. But, before we assume that the spirits of our brass vessel are merely a collection of private individual fantasies and yearnings, we must remember that the ancient philosopher known as Hermes Trismegistus, called Thrice Greatest Hermes, declared in his famous Emerald Tablet, True it is, without falsehood, certain and most true, that that which is above is like to that which is below, and that which is below is like to that which is above, to accomplish the miracles of one thing. Based upon this profound revelation, the Magi of classical times, the later medieval sorcerers, and the Renaissance magicians believed that the human mind was a miniature functioning model of the vast universe itself. The greater universe could be manipulated by magical operations within the personal sphere. Hermes Trismegistus had even gone so far as to suggest that in days of old men had created their own lesser gods. An ancient, outmoded, superstitious belief, your high school science teacher might say. Well, ancient, yes, but hardly obsolete. After 2,000 years, this strange statement by the original founder of Hermetic philosophy 
was finally explained in modern terms by the eminent psychologist Carl Gustav Jung. In the 1920s, Jung presented his revolutionary theory that beneath and beyond the personal subconscious mind, there flowed a vast, deep sea of dream images and forgotten lore. He referred to this as the collective unconscious. This mysterious psychic ocean was not the exclusive property of any individual human being. It was a dimension shared by all of us. Here one might discover the great archetypes of mythology, the heroes, the beautiful courtesans, the martyred saints, and the monstrous villains of our past. Here were the mysterious man-created gods, which Hermes Trismegistus had written about so long ago. And here were the demons of King Solomon's brass vessel. Jung's famous colleague, Sigmund Freud, was quick to realize the significance of what Jung had discovered, or rediscovered, and Freud was horrified by it. Carl, he whispered, you must not present this theory to the public, for if you do, you will release a black flood of occultism. But it would take more than Carl Jung's archetype and collective unconscious theories to release this flood of occultism that Freud feared. Theories by themselves do not produce results. For results, the magician still depends today, as he did thousands of years ago, on methods and techniques. Since time immemorial, magicians have placed themselves and others into states of trance, during which visions and oracles were received. We now know that this process was hypnotic, and that all the phenomena we have come to associate with modern hypnosis was in fact known and practiced by ancient sorcerers under the guise of fascination, spellcasting, and enchantment. The powerful hypnotic effect achieved through a fixed gaze on a reflective surface is the reason why the crystal ball or shoe stone and the dark mirror or speculum were used by wizards of olden times as their spiritus loci, the actual place where angels and spirits could be conjured to visible appearance. This was, and still is, a hypnotic process. And yet the final secret of how to employ these magical aids was always missing. With all the atmosphere, the philosophy, the paraphernalia, the powerful conjurations and the hypnotic effects, a spontaneous vision in the crystal or in the dark mirror always depended upon some special psychic ability. One had to be a natural medium. And for all my toxic fever dreams and my hypnotic experiments, I had certainly become a mystic, but not a clairvoyant. And yet there had to be a way, a way that anybody with the desire and the determination could summon these spirits to visible appearance and have conversation with them. I tried placing a crystal ball in the triangle, but then when I stepped back inside the magic circle, as the operator was supposed to do according to the ancient texts, the 60 millimeter ball appeared the size of a doorknob. Therefore, I knew that the crystal had to be used inside the circle for the invocation of the angels. And yet, we had to put something in that triangle, something fascinating, something hypnotic, and something large enough to provide a viewing surface. Yes, the speculum, the dark mirror, and what better entrance into those caverns measured man the poet Coleridge had envisioned in his mystic eye. It had to be the dark mirror, but how to use it, how to make it actually work, I asked myself. And then something that I had read the year before jogged my memory. Something about the use of dark mirrors in the Far East.
The final clue had been sitting on my bookshelf all the time. The book was called Tantra, the Yoga of Sex by Omar Garrison. In this work, the author described an ancient oriental method of invoking the images of previous incarnations from the reflection of one's own face in a dark mirror flanked by candles. As I reread this section in Garrison's book, I felt a shiver of excitement. I was experiencing the same thrill that an archaeologist must feel as he brushes away the sand and looks down at the unbroken seal of an ancient royal tomb. I tried Garrison's experiment, and I found that it worked with remarkable effectiveness. If one stares in a darkened room into a mirror flanked by candles, after several minutes, a strange phenomenon will almost always occur. The familiar reflection will fade out, the mirror will go black, and then when the image returns, it will be the face of someone or something else. This ex any concept of reincarnation. It probably went back as far as the Paleolithic, when Stone Age people stared fascinated at their reflections in dark, still pools of water, seeing the strange transformation occur and being convinced that they were in the presence of their gods. I suspected that in a ritual setting using traditional conjurations and symbols, specific spirits and even ancient gods and goddesses might be summoned from the other side. This might well be the hidden meaning behind that strange passage in the Bible that reads, God fashioned man in his own image. I command the experience is usually accompanied by a profound sense of an otherworldly presence. It was obvious that this phenomenon must have been discovered a long time before he by the Tetragrammaton. Oh, by which the elements are overturned, the air is sundered, the fire is generated. The earth moves, the sea rolls back, and all those of things celestial, of things terrestrial, of things infernal, do tremble and are confounded together. Come, appear before this circle, within that triangle, in fair and human form, without horror or deformity and without delay. Come from whatever part of the world thou art and answer my questions. Come presently, come visibly, come affably and manifest that which I desire. Being summoned by the true and living God, Iliorum, I command thee by the particular king who rules over thee, the mighty Amaman, and by the power of the archangel Raphael, I command thee, appear before me, and speak unto me in a clear, intelligible voice in my mother tongue, free from ambiguity and guile. Come in the name of Adonai Zabaoth. Come, why dost thou tarry? I don't hide, Jedi. King of Kings commands thee. I've not been dead, but only sleeping. Hardly longer than a wink. I'll be up and rolling thunder once I have another drink.
<laughs> After this discovery, the use of the magic mirror in an elevated triangle seemed obvious. This 17th century Lamegaton manuscript clearly shows a large, black-filled circle in the center of Solomon's triangle. Notice that the instructions written around the triangle say two foot off from the circle and three foot over, not three foot across as the published version has it. The triangle was intended to be raised up to eye level. And this drawing from a 16th century manuscript by the mysterious Dr. Thomas Rudd shows a mirror on a stand with Solomon's secret seal from the Goetia of the Lamegaton clearly depicted on the reverse side, exactly like my original setup. We know that polished obsidian mirrors were used in the Neolithic Middle Eastern city of Katal Hayuk as far back as 9,000 years ago, before the Great Flood. And later, in the time of Solomon, the Egyptians and the Canaanites made mirrors of polished copper and of silver, metals attributed to the planet Venus and the moon. I extended my experiments to include others, and I soon discovered that it was even more effective if the magician stood behind a passive receiver who could then concentrate totally on the mirror. Under the power of the Archangel Uriel, through the Angel Mendiel, in the realm of the King Zimanar, and by Barlamensis, Alikiensis, Almancia, Apollo. I am here. What do you desire of me? And so I had the secret. Like Dr. Frankenstein, I had learned how to do it. But even though I may have been as obsessed as the fictional Dr. Frankenstein, I didn't want to make his mistake. Before I opened the brass vessel and released these spirits into the world again, I wanted to fully understand the philosophical and spiritual significance of a system that had been such a closely guarded secret for so many thousands of years. I had to ask myself, was it possible that there might be slumbering demons in our past that, as the late Howard Phillips Lovecraft had suggested, might better be left unawakened? How had the beautiful goddess Astarte and her handsome consort, Prince Baal the Thunder God, been transformed into demons in the medieval forbidden books of black magic. I found the answers to these questions in the mysterious, long-lost biblical book of Enoch. In those mythical prehistoric times before the Great Flood, the Book of Enoch tells of a war in heaven in which God and his loyal host of angels, led by the archangel Michael, were arrayed against a horde of rebellious angels who had lusted after the daughters of men and had descended to earth, where they were breeding a race of giants and were teaching humans the forbidden secrets of sorcery and magic. The Book of Enoch goes on to relate that the four great archangels, Mikael, Raphael, Gabriel, and Oriel, came down and imprisoned these fallen angels at the four corners of the earth, where they became known as the Watchers. Jewish, Christian, and Islamic theologies retained the traditional loyal angels of heaven, especially those four great beings who rule the quarters of the universe, Raphael, Mikael, Gabriel, and Oriel, that they had no place for the gods and goddesses of the ancient pagan religions they had conquered. And so the rabbis, the priests, and the imams 
practiced a sleight of hand trick and reclassified the homeless but not forgotten pagan deities as those same fallen angels who were already chained in deep pits at the ends of the earth. Thus, their greatest rival, the Canaanite thunder god, Prince Baal, became the demon Baal, first among the ranks of the fallen, who was said to appear as a cat, a toad, or a man, or all three at once, and to grant the power of invisibility. Prince Baal's beautiful consort, the goddess Astarte, queen of heaven, and mistress of the temple of love, was transformed into the demon Astaroth, described as a hurtful angel with bad breath, but who, when summoned, would reveal the true history of the fallen angels. And she certainly has fulfilled that promise. This prehistoric myth of the fallen angels laid the foundation for a Middle Eastern legend about the biblical King Solomon, who was said to have been the greatest magician of ancient times. According to our legend, Solomon, armed with the power of God's holy angels, bound and sealed those 72 rebellious spirits, or genie, into the brass vessel, from which he called them forth to do his bidding, even to assist him in building the great and holy temple at Jerusalem. But can our fantastic legend have any truth behind it? Are we really seeing these ancient gods and goddesses who became the fallen angels in the dark mirror in our magic triangle? Are the strange voices that speak through our lips during the magical channeling process really coming from these deities and demons of the dim past? Have we actually opened that lost portal between the worlds? And if so, can these powerful genie be commanded to reveal hidden knowledge and accomplish wonderful things? Well, the only way you're going to know for certain is to look into the dark mirror yourself. But I warn you, unless you take Solomon's magic very seriously, you should have nothing to do with these experiments. This ancient art is not a party game or a Halloween prank. There is no place in the magic circle for the dabbler or the thrill seeker. Every aspect of this system, spiritual, psychological, and technical, must be thoroughly understood before these experiments are undertaken. Like knights of olden times, magicians must be trained armed and armored before they go on a quest into the spirit realm. First you should know that the magic circle is your philosophical fortress when you open the gateway between the worlds. It represents the perfect circle of the vast universe and the unbroken boundary of your own being, which are one and the same when you practice Solomon's art, as above, so below, as within, so without. You should know that even back in ancient times, the triangle represented the philosophical first plane of manifestation. It acts as a cage containing and restraining the spirits you evoke. For the moment, let us imagine that we are participating in the original act of creation back at the dawn of time, out in the vast reaches of cosmic space. First, we will create just one point. Next, we, or God, will establish a second point and connect it to the first so that we have a line. Then, when we plot our third point, we have our triangle, the first flat surface. Now, when we create point four, we have the first solid. We have created a thing. And, as long as we refrain from establishing point five, setting our thing in motion, we will constrain our creation to remain in its position. We will keep our spirit within the triangle. Traditionally, the name of the Archangel Michael, the Angel of Power, was separated into three syllables, M-I-C-H-A-E-L, and written in the corners of the triangle. 
to add a visual emphasis to the symbolic geometry that bound the spirit. You must understand this concept thoroughly before you open Solomon's brass vessel and release the genie. It matters not whether you are a Christian, a Jew, a Muslim, or even a pagan. These archangels are very much a part of our Western tradition. They represent the positive forces that drive the engine of the universe and the love that holds it all together. In the order of the Temple of Astarte, we conceive and visualize them as complementary male and female beings. For angels can appear in any form they wish, or any suitable form that your imagination can provide for them. They activate your magic circle of protection. Casting your circle with a pentagram ritual before each operation is certainly important, but that alone is not enough. The great archangels must live in your mind and in your heart. You must have them inside as well as outside. Nosce te ipsum, en tuo templo tu es deus. This is the very first time we have ever permitted cameras into the inner sanctum of the order of the Temple of Astarte. Notice the names of the great archangels of the quarters in Phoenician around the magic circle. You will hear these same names invoked in the traditional pentagram ritual that precedes and follows every magical operation. But I say again, the pentagram ritual by itself is not enough. You have to have these four great archangels of the quarters indwelling within you and ready to help you control the rebellious spirits. Otherwise, opening the brass vessel would be like opening Pandora's box, which, according to the ancient Greek myth, released evil into the world and then could not be reclosed. Therefore, you must first master the art of angelic invocation before you proceed to its darker counterpart, the evocation of Solomon's 72 spirits. Along with the secret of the mirror in the triangle, the other crucially important element missing from the Galatian was the fact that the 72 spirits of the brass vessel had 72 direct counterparts in the holy angels of the Shemham Farash, or extended name of God. Now these derived or suffix angels are not as personified as the archangels of the quarters or the angels of the planetary spheres, but they do provide a direct channel of power through which the four archangels of the quarters control each and every one of the spirits of the brass vessel. Unless this concept is understood and integrated into your goetic operations, you are on spiritually dangerous ground. These Shemham Farash angels even have their own sigils, and there is a short invocation for each one of them. The careful operator should use both. And before anyone in the order of the Temple of Astarte is allowed to participate in goetic operations, we insist that they experience a series of four archangelic invocations. So how do we invoke the archangels? Well, there's another book in the Lamegaton Compendium that probably should have been published with the Goetia. It's called the Almadel of Solomon and gives us a very effective method for invoking, and by that I mean calling down the angels. The original Almadel was a tabletop device made entirely of wax. This was an ingenious design. The square slab of wax had holes at each corner through which the four candles were inserted, 
leaving enough length below to raise the little platform high enough so that a small incense burner could be placed beneath it. From where the incense fumes could rise through another set of holes to envelop the crystal shoe stone in mysterious tendrils of fragrant smoke, thus adding to the hypnotic effect. As with the Goetia, the secrets of the Almadel were not clearly explained in the Lamegaton. I had to use equal measures of scholarship and inspiration to reconstruct and fine-tune the system. But the effort was certainly worth the trouble because the Almadel angels control the Goetia spirits. I know that statement may be surprising to some magical scholars who never look beyond, uh, to quote Cornelius Agrippa again, what is writ in the bare letters. The Almadel's angels are not arranged in an ascending hierarchy. They are attributed to the four quarters and the twelve signs of the zodiac, with each of the four quarters governing the three astrological signs particular to its nature. In other words, the signs of air, fire, water, and earth, which we know are governed by the four great archangels of the quarters, Raphael, Mikael, Gabriel, and Oriel. Realizing this, we can simply disregard the late 17th century hodgepodge of garbled angelic names the Lamegaton's scribe has attributed to these altitudes and thus restore the Almadel system to its full power and purpose, as shown here in our Master Mandala. Each of the four great archangels of the quarters empower three sets of six Shemham Farash angels, who in turn control three sets of six counterpart Goetia spirits, which are distributed, two to each of the 36 decans, or 10 degree divisions of an astrological sign. This occurs in similar order all around the zodiac. If you find this confusing at first glance, you can study the Master Mandala in the companion book to this video, the Book of Solomon's Magic. The design may appear complicated, but it is actually quite simple and easy to work with. You will note that our modern Almadel is combined with the traditional double cube altar. We have shielded the candles at the four corners, and an incense chamber below has been added, with slots cut around the central compass rows to allow the rising smoke to surround our crystal shoe stone, which is placed on our master mandala that unifies the Goetia and Almadel systems in one all-encompassing design. Notice that we've placed low stools around the foot of the altar so that four or more people may sit and gaze up at the smoke-shrouded crystal haloed in spectral light, with nothing else in their field of vision. Now, let's see how this works in actual practice. Before every magical operation, whether of invocation or evocation, we open our circle and call down the archangelic guardians of the quarters with a Golden Dawn style invoking ritual of the Lesser Pentagram. And, at the conclusion of the ceremony, we will employ the banishing version of the same rite to close and seal the gateway between the worlds. Ata, Malkut, Vegabura, Vegadura, Neolam, Om. Amasha O Adonai Ahea. Ata, Gabor, Leolam, Adonai. Before me, Raphael. Behind me, Gabriel. At my right hand, Mikael. At my left hand, Oriel. Around us flame the pentagrams. Above us shines the six-rayed star. 
Atta, Malkut, Vegabura, Vegadula, Leolam, Om. We call thee Great Archangel Raphael in the name of Tetragrammaton Amashau Come to us, O Guardian of the Eastern Quadrant Master Teacher, Loving Healer Wielder of the Sword of Truth and Lord of the Aerial Realm Come, we beseech thy presence here upon this holy table. Shine forth from this pellucid crystal. Grant us a glimpse of thy glory and a whisper of thy wisdom. Raphael, As the soft chanting continues, each person around the circle will invoke in his or her turn until the altar top is haloed with an electric blue aura of astral energy shot through with gold and rays of light. Then you know you are on holy ground, and the angel may speak through any one of you. You may not see Raphael in the crystal, but you will certainly sense his presence. You will feel his power, and his voice will speak within you. Until you have made such a connection and established such a bond with all four of the archangels, you must not venture further into the darker realms of Solomon's magic. Great Archangel Mikael, Guardian of the Southern Quadrant, Master of the Sacred Lands, Warrior and Defender, Lord of the Realm of Fire, Come, grant us a measure of thy power and a warning of any dangers that might lie before us. Great Archangel Gabriel, Guardian of the Western Quadrant, Lady of the Waters and Mistress of the Holy Grail, quicken within us the faculties of sympathy and of intuition. Grant us a glimpse of thy mystic grace and an oracle from thy vast dark ocean of understanding. Great Archangel Auriel, Guardian of the Northern Quadrant, Lady of the Earth and Mistress of the Holy Pantacle of Art, bring us in harmony with nature's cycle and make fertile all our just desires. Bestow upon us thy love and lead us unto thy treasures. In the name of Adonai, Haaretz, Aurel, Remember, you're invoking these angels, not evoking them. Evocation means bringing something out of yourself. Invocation is like praying. You're calling them down from above. You're inviting them to visit you. You're asking them for their help. So you shouldn't command them. And you certainly shouldn't banish them after the operation is over. You thank them. You ask them to come again and you bid them hail and farewell. Now that we have the four 
great archangels of the quadrants firmly on our side, we're ready to open Solomon's brass vessel and call forth the genie to appear in the dark mirror on the triangle of art. As an example, we're going to summon the spirit Astaroth, who is described in the Goetia as a great and powerful duke whose lamen is to be made out of copper. Copper is the metal attributed to the planet Venus. This is appropriate because the spirit Astaroth is actually the ancient Canaanite goddess Astarte. Therefore, we will operate as if we are evoking her in the seventh Kabbalistic sphere of Netzach, with the understanding that all operations of the Goetia take place in the lunar sphere of Yasod. Remember, each sphere contains its own tree of life complete. This concept is not difficult to grasp if we think of the moon as a silver mirror through which all the multicolored lights of the higher spheres are reflected. And keeping this in mind, we should always perform our evocations when the moon is waxing. Pay very close attention to every detail of what you're about to see. This is the first time a complete operation of goetic thaumaturgy has ever been visually recorded. We're going to call forth the spirit Astaroth, who is actually Astarte, the queen of heaven and the patron goddess of our temple. It was in her honor and through her inspiration that I founded the Order of the Temple of Astarte in 1970 to properly teach Solomon's magic to worthy students of the art. We have continued this tradition in an unbroken continuity for 25 years, initiating and instructing over a hundred here in our temple. After the lesser pentagram, which we have already demonstrated, the operator should perform a planetary septagram ritual, internalizing and then externalizing the Kabbalistic lunar sphere of Yasod, within which all goetic operations are encompassed. circumambulation commence. Seven turns deosu in the sphere of Netzach of Yassar. Oh, 
awoke the bornless one, thee that didst create the earth and the heavens, thee that didst create the darkness and the light, thou art Osiris and Ophris, Osiris the beautiful, whom no one hath seen at any time. Thou hast distinguished between the just and the unjust, thou didst make the female and the male, Thou didst produce the seed and the fruit. Thou didst form us to love one another and to hate one another. I invoke thee, the terrible and invisible God who dwelleth in the void place of the spirit. I am he, the bornless spirit. I am he, the truth. I am he who hates that evil should be wrought in the world. I am he that brings the lightning and the thunder. I am he who showereth life upon the earth. I am he, the grace of the world. The heart girt with the serpent is my name. Come thou forth and follow me, and make all spirits subject unto me, so that every spirit of the firmament and of the aether, upon the earth and under the earth, on dry land or in the water, of whirling air or of rushing fire, and every spell and scourge of God may be obedient unto me. Domine delixi decorum, dominus tuae, et locum habitationis gloria tuae, mendiel. Welcome, you goddess Astarte. We apologize for summoning you with such strong incantations. But we hasten to declare that we command only that portion of you that dwells within us. Your higher presence we hold in true reverence and serve in all humility. Goddess, do you have an oracle for us? I have an oracle for all those who would seek me. Each priestess must call me forth through her own image and in her own time. It is enough that you have opened the gate Now, each one must make her own sacred journey. Great Goddess Astarte, we thank thee for having attended our rites and granting our wishes. And as we release your special presence to return to your lovely realm, we ask that your essence remain stronger within us. And we ask that you return to us when called by the rites of holy magic. Hail and farewell. There are a few things I should mention about the ceremony you've just seen. If you demand the presence of a spirit who is actually an ancient god or a goddess, then you should apologize to them when they appear. Now the reason is this. Our ancestors transformed these ancient deities into demons and imprisoned them down in the brass vessel of the collective unconscious. Now, you can treat them like medieval demons. You can conjure them with powerful incantations. You can use the curse of chains, or you can torment them into coming by burning their sigils. But then how do you think they're going to treat you? Remember, they are part of you just as you are a part of the universal mind which we all share. 
They appear from the collective unconscious through your reflection when you evoke them. And they return to the universal mind through your image when they depart. For this reason, you should treat even the lowest of their number with respect and the gods and goddesses among them with veneration. And for this reason, you should never, under any circumstances, attempt to use this system of evocation to bring harm to any other person. Now the reason for this should be obvious, but just to make sure you understand, this would be magically similar to calling up your enemy on the telephone and then detonating a hand grenade inside your phone booth instead of his. He may hear the explosion, but you're the one who's going to get blown up. You think about that. And recall the proverbial wisdom of King Solomon. Remember that the genie of the brass vessel were charged with teaching us the arts and the sciences. Therefore, we should use Solomon's magic to grow in wisdom and understanding. We should use these secret methods to explore the inner realms of the astral plane and to experience the glories of the angels and the wonders of the spirit realm. If you use Solomon's magic in God's name and with a pure heart, you have nothing to fear and others should have no reason to fear you. Now that we've returned from our magical journey, and you understand how Solomon's magic really works, you might be asking yourself, why is all this being revealed? Why are we showing you, without initiation and training, secret techniques that have been closely guarded through the ages? Why have we shown you the actual equipment and how to use it? Well, the truth is, we really didn't want to reveal these techniques to the general public, but in 25 years, during which time I personally initiated and trained over 100 students, it's not surprising that our secrets would leak out. At the present time, there are several small groups presuming to teach our methods, and a few years back, a former member of our order self-published a partial and oversimplified version of our system, which in turn became the authoritative source for a chapter on magical evocation in a beginning primer on ceremonial magic issued by a major publisher. Recalling the magical misadventures of that world-famous mouse in Walt Disney's film Fantasia, we might say that these apprentice sorcerers have opened the brass vessel and let out all the spirits, which has compelled me to come down from my wizard's tower and show you how to get them all back in again. I was responsible for the rediscovery and the modern development of the Goetia Almadel system we have explained and demonstrated in this video. And because it's no longer a secret, I now feel obligated to make the authentic and genuine system available to all sincere students who want to learn how to correctly practice this ancient art. In closing, Please remember that Solomon's magic is a valid is closed. Ooh.